This is the beginning of Lecture 15, Lecture 15, Part 1. In Lectures 13 and 14, we uh, spent some time getting to know ozone. We uh, learned about where it was, how it got there, how it's in the troposphere versus the stratosphere, um, <clears throat> that it uh, has some harmful effects in the, um, in the troposphere, and we recognized that we needed to understand that, that uh, uh, molecular element, oxygen or ozone, um, a little bit better on a deeper level to really understand the differences in the chemical and physical properties between ozone and oxygen. Um, and so we had to take a little uh, side step and learn about Lewis structures and use the Lewis structures as a tool to help just look at covalent compounds that we call molecules and understand um, bonding, covalent bonding. And by using the Lewis structures we were able to understand that you know some molecules in order to satisfy their valence shell um, lowest energy, which would be as an octet, that they need to form single bonds or double bonds, or they're going to be found in different places within the molecule. And we also learned that the single bonds versus double bonds versus triple bonds have different bond strengths, um, and that the double bond is stronger than the single bond. And so we're now at the point where we can start to understand the interaction of ultraviolet uh, light with ozone um, on a deeper level. And so in general, the topic here is electromagnetic radiation and matter, um, but specifically we're going to be looking at the type of electromagnetic radiation called ultraviolet radiation and the matter that we're really going to focus on is ozone and oxygen and some other small molecules in the atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> but there's a bigger story about how electromag different forms of electromagnetic radiation um, interact with matter differently, and we'll be looking at that, that story as we um, move on to the next chapter as well. But for now, we need to focus on, um, in particular, ultraviolet light and, um, and ozone. So um, I wanted to take a minute to, to point out this word radiation first, electromagnetic radiation. We've talked about radiation uh, once before, and that was in Unit 1. We were looking at nuclear radiation, and we said there's you know, three basic forms of nuclear radiation, alpha, radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. Now alpha and beta are different um, forms of radiation, the nuclear radiation as we call them, different than electromagnetic radiation. And the reason why it's different is because an alpha radiation is a particle, there's a mass associated with it, um, the, it's a nucleus of a helium atom. And so it's a fast moving nucleus, it's a fast moving little piece of, of nucleus basically that, that is spun off the nucleus of the atom um, from which it originates. And then also a beta particle, similar deal, it's a fast moving electron. So they have mass and high kinetic energy. Electromagnetic, and then gamma radiation actually has no mass. And so it is a form of electromagnetic radiation. So gamma radiation is sometimes called nuclear radiation and sometimes called electromagnetic radiation because it's both. Um, now, electromagnetic radiation is, is moving energy that has no mass, all right? And as it turns out, there's a continual spectrum of radiation, and we'll look at how we define those different parts of the spectrum here in a minute. But we know that there must be something about um, the interaction of ultraviolet light or radiation and ozone because of the Dobson unit that we talked about last time. And the Dobson unit, the amount of ultraviolet radiation that's reaching a detector at ground level is correlated to the amount of ozone in the column. Okay, so what does all of that mean? The amount of ultraviolet radiation reaching a detector at ground level is correlated to the amount of ozone in the column. What that means is, is the, the less ultraviolet radiation that reaches the de detector that, that has been correlated by this unit to the um, amount of ozone present. So ultraviolet light must be... Um, interacting with ozone. So if you go back to the picture we've looked at many times, um, this picture of the ozone concentration on September 25th, 2006, and remember what we're talking about, they're talking about the ultraviolet light coming from the sun to the top of the atmosphere, and remember the way the Dobson unit is defined is, is the amount of ozone in a column of air going from the, uh, the atmosphere, going from ground level all the way up to the outer you know, 35, 40 miles up to the outer edges of the atmosphere. And um, so when we talk about Dobson unit, we're talking about, you know, how much ozone is in this column. 
And what we're, we're hearing now is that the way they detect how much ozone is in the column is by comparing the amount of ultraviolet light that would be at the top of the column versus the amount of ultraviolet light that would be detected at the bottom of the column. So what happens to the ultraviolet light as it passes through this, if you will, column of atmosphere? Well, energy can't be created or destroyed. So obviously, since we're correlating it to the concentration of ozone, there must be some interaction with the ultraviolet light of the ultraviolet light with ozone in the atmosphere. Okay, so there's a lot of details here that we need to um, un uh, understand to really understand that sentence. The ultraviolet light, um, you know, the amount of ultraviolet light at the top of the atmosphere is less than the amount of ultraviolet light at the bottom of the atmosphere. And so we want to understand um, how that happens and what we're talking about.